So, um, I am Mary Ann McQueen. I'm Vice President of Village Council. And I'm uh, the Council Liaison to the Environmental Commission. The Environmental Commission, as well as some of the village staff, have created a, a team that has been working for the village government on the Bernays situation. So I'm going to introduce the meeting. I'll introduce you to the panel lists and then to uh, Len Kramer and Jane Scott, who are going to facilitate the meeting. So our panel is Abinash Agrawal, a professor at Wright State University on environmental site cleanup. Johnny. Johnny Burns, um, Director of Public Works for the Village. We'll be sitting right there, I guess. <laughs> Dr. Denise Taylor from, right, from UD, Environmental Engineer. Tom Dietrich, who's a member of the Environmental Commission. Josue Salmaron, who's our Village Manager. So these are our panel who will be making the presentation, and I'm going to turn the meeting. But first, thank you for coming. We will keep time with this, so we will be out at seven. And I'm going to turn the meeting over now to Len, who will facilitate. I'm really only going to explain the process now, and then we'll get into the presentations. Um, I'm Len Kramer, volunteer facilitator with the Village Mediation Program. My co-facilitator is Gene Scott, who's been handing out, busily handing out the cards. Um, after the presentations, we'll begin the Q&A, so we're asking you to hold your questions. That's what the cards are for. Please write any questions that you have as they occur to you, and we'll collect the cards as they fill up, raise them up, we'll come around and come up. Um, Address your questions to a specific person if you want to be answered by the specific person. Uh, I mean, write the name down. Um, when you've completed your question, well, that's the same thing. Raise your hand. We'll, we'll collect them. Mary Ann will help us with that. Uh, once we're into the questions and answers, I'll read the questions. So please try to make them legible. I, my writing's terrible. But I hope yours is better than mine. Um, and if we run out of time uh, before we get through all the questions on the cards, um, we'll submit all those questions to Josue to get answers, and you'll be updated by email, which is another reason for signing in. Um, if you have comments rather than a question, put it on the cards. We'll submit the comments to the village manager, and he'll consider them as they move on through the process. If we have additional time remaining before 7, we'll open the floor to comments and more questions. Okay? Any questions about the process? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, when you say the comments, are the comments going to be read or not? No. That's questions will be read. because they need other questions. But that's the way, you know, we're trying to get out of here at 7. Thank you. Okay? And if there's time, we'll do some of that. Okay? Um, any other questions about the process? Okay, let's go. Who's first? All right. Thank you, Len. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for making time to join us today. Um, as you recall from last meeting, there's a lot of questions and folks wanting to know more. So this is a direct follow-up to the last EPA meeting. Uh, so thank you for joining us and making us aware of your concerns. And that's why we coordinated this meeting and we've coordinated the content for this meeting to provide the foundation of the background and the plans moving forward, the overview of the remediation plan to help inform the audience and address any concerns you have. So here's the agenda for today. Um, we'll have a panel presentation that includes the panelists, and in those uh, that presentation, we'll talk about where we are with the EPA process and next steps, the review of village work. That's the work of the village manager, the subcommittee that has been created uh, to address the remediation plan, and within that, subcommittee there's been tasks that's been created for requests for additional information or request of EPA or Brene and other related matters. Then we'll do an overview of village uh, concerns. We have a list of the concerns that have been raised to us, so we'll look to address um, those specific concerns, and then we'll enter into the facilitated Q&A. And then we'll have um, 
some closing remarks. How were these topics created? Did villagers send in these concerns? And the answer is that there's been feedback. We've received questions and feedback from our residents, and that's how we created these, uh, highlighted our particular concerns. Okay. Tom, did you want to add anything to that? No, it's a good. Okay. Excellent. All right, so we'll move to the next slide. That the next slide? Okay. In a nutshell, this is the proposed remediation plan. Um, remove the soil where the highest concentration exists. Continue operation of the four pump and treat systems. Replace the storm sewer and seal off the pathway for migration. And continue monitoring the well sites, wells on site and off site. Tom, anything you want to add to that? That's, that's it in a nutshell. We're trying to, trying to just provide a, a simple explanation of what's going on and then identify, you know, a little more detail as we go on. So I just want to try to give you a base information to start with. Sorry, I'll use the mic next time. Okay. All right, and these are non-concerns. This is what we've heard from the public, from the residents, um, from folks that we're working with. Um, migration happening off-site. What are the existing utilities on site, future maintenance risks, potential pathways for migration, and there are, is there a village water source or, or water well system, water protection areas? What are the concerns around there? Uh, behind me, you will see two graphs. Uh, Johnny and the public works team put together the map on, the, on your left-hand side, and that overlays all of our utilities, the hotspots, and the plume. And in one of the graphs, you'll see a overlay of this area of the water protection plan, the drawings or projections on what that area is. And there'll be overlay on top of that. So you'll see in proximity of how those two overlap. Tom, anything you want to comment on this? Um, we'll, we'll, is this on? Is the green light on? It is. But, um, There's a, lot of de there's a lot of detail on this as well. Um, the only thing I'll say about this is it's uh, an estimated estimate of the groundwater area, the, co the capture area for, the, uh, for our water. So that's why it's called source water. For, uh, that's where we get all of our water that's served to the public. Um, so this is the overall estimated area that where we could be getting our groundwater from. So this is the one year time of travel to get to the plant. This is the five year time of travel because groundwater moves very slowly. Um, and this is the overall estimated area where groundwater comes toward the wellhead, right, where we get our water. So again, it's an estimate. We don't know what's going on underground, and that's part of the confusion with, or the concerns with, you know, with the pollution as well. So, uh, this is what we have to go on right now. And, and Tom, how old is this graph, just for context? 1999. No, 2001 it was created in 2001. So, we probably should update that um, because it's, um, you know, technology is updated as well. So it was a recommendation. Uh, from the Environmental Commission that we, you know, hire the hydrogeologists that are needed to get us that update. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you please orient us to that map, like give us sort of a sense of where this village is? And you are here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Dating Street, Azini Avenue. Can you identify the high school? The high school. Can you identify all of those three big buildings at the end of that thing? This is the old Bernays site, actually. This is Annie Publishing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the high school. Right. So, yeah, it's right there at the edge. And there's another. We've got a better figure that'll zoom in <coughs> on this related to this. So we'll we'll look at that because again. It is one of the concerns that, that we, we have. We have to get the slides, but it's an actual three slides. Like the yeah, that's on. That's, that's, that's why I'm pointing at the screen because okay. it's coming up. Yeah. All right. First, we want to cover the timeline. 
uh, this is the proposed uh, EPA timeline. As you know, we had this public session in October. The statement of basis is expected to be released in January 2020, and that's going to be followed by a public comment period of uh, 45 days, and then there's a final decision that the EPA will make around the summer of 2020. <coughs> Now, this is our timeline on the most recent remediation plan. As you know, this, the team has been working on this remediation for years. But this timeline here, uh, we want to highlight the most recent work. So June 17, we, got, we received word that the final remediation plan uh, was released and was sent to us. That also happens to be the day that I was hired. So, Josue, welcome to the final remediation plan. Uh, then, since then, we've held over 13 meetings with the, the work group, the, the subcommittee that's been tasked to uh, make sense of the remediation and, and determine our former position. We held a public info session. We also held meetings with the EPA, and that was in October. And um, moving forward, we've got the statement of basis to be released uh, to have a public info and EPA meetings as a result of the public the statement of basis uh, that meeting will be taking place around February, March of 2020, and then the final decision uh, for EPA to be made in summer 2020. What's the statement of basis? Yeah, so uh, I did want to just say these are, this is sort of EPA's, this is their process, right? We're trying to plug into their process. We are plugging into their process, and we want you all to plug in as well. So we're trying to educate the public. When EPA was here last time, felt like they didn't quite outline how it affects you and how do you make your voice heard. So, um, and that's why I want to give credit to the village and, and to Josue immediately. He said to me, we should have a town hall. We, there's a lot of interest in this and we need to answer more questions. So that's what this meeting is about. It's just to get more questions out there, get comments in. You can submit comments. once. The, where is it? Statement of basis is when EPA submits their first ruling on this final draft plan. Okay? So when they submitted their plan, EPA is reviewing it. They're going to say, yes, okay, we agree with this. This is what we're proposing to move forward with. And that's when the public has the opportunity to say, yeah, we agree with that. We don't agree with that. We, you know, you can have your input. That's. Um, so there, there should be another public meeting here um, once that's released. It'll be 45 days once it's released for you, all the public to provide comment. EPA then takes all those comments back, filters them, responds to all of them. They're required to respond to everyone and then um, submit their final decision. And then that is what will move forward and be the, the plan that is implemented. Thank you. All right, so that's the timeline. Now we get into the content. Um, everyone just jump in. All right, we'll, we'll walk through the through these diagrams. We'll show you all the diagrams, and then we'll get into content specific. And we'll refer back to these diagrams um, to provide context of what we're speaking about. So this image just came from, directly from TRC, which is the the one of the documents in the final remediation plan. So we're referring to those to many of those documents because that's the final remediation plan. So in this in this particular diagram, this demonstrates the the plume, the wells, the hot spots, and a couple of the testing uh, areas they conduct the test. And there's some references to the results of those tests. So this is the the large diagram. Can't see a lot of detail, but we'll zoom in. Uh, in some of the key areas. So here this gives you the picture of where the plume, uh, where the contaminated soil is, where the plume spread, and generally what area we're talking about. Real quick context for this. The plume is based on sampling that uh, was conducted, as well as modeling that was conducted by Bernay. So um, it's an estimate, but it's based on um, the science that Brene has put forth. So there's some discrepancy, there's some discussion about the validity of the modeling, so there's been some back and forth. Um, so, but this is what's been proposed by Brene in, in their plan. 
Would you identify the roads so people? Yeah. So the see. next couple slides zoom in a little bit so you can see a little more in context. So that zooms into the site, Dayton Street, and Enon, and the high schools over here. Um, and then, you know, focuses in more on Omar Circle area. And then more off to the east toward Wright Street. And you show Wright and Street and uh, Green. Wright Street, Suncrest, Green Street, Limestone. If you come if you're back to this, I'm sorry. How deep are you talking about? What's the Z dimension here? Five feet, 500 feet? So shall we start writing down questions? Yeah. Could you go back? I don't quickly know the answer to that. Back. That's how it's it went by too fast. It, Thank you. Um, yeah, so, the so these three these three common areas indicate that there is a sample test done there, yeah, yeah. and the results of that test are below the MCL's um, threshold. In the table, there's a a, a um, a list of terms, a glossary of some of the terminology there in these slides and some of the terminology that we'll reference to. Um, so I hope you got a copy of that. There's also a copy of the EPA presentation that they conducted last time they were here. So we provided that material as a reference material for you. Okay. All right. This diagram shows the hot spots, the soil that's contaminated. So these, these are those uh, black squares um, and yellow squares. Um, it also indicates where the storm sewer lines are. Part of the proposal is to um, replace the sewer lines and create these, uh, a new sewer uh, system. Again, this is also a zoom in of that previous uh, diagram. You see the hot spots. You see the uh, indication of where the physical structures were. Um, you'll see that some of this document here, um, those buildings don't exist anymore, but this is a representation of where they would have been. <coughs> Tom, you want to talk about your... Well, that's just uh, in terms of the proposed remediation, those circled areas are, like Josue said, the hot spots. So that's where Bernay has proposed to do excavation of the soil, remove it, and, and dispose of it appropriately backfill with clean material um, and then so those are the the areas and that's one of the things that people are debating is what is which you know th that's just the highest concentration areas so is that sufficient adequate cleanup to protect you know human health and the environment um, so that's one of the things so that's the, the debate is you know at, to what degree do we need to clean it up to they've made it clear you know it's not going to they're not going to get all the pollutants out right it's going to be cleaned up to a standard that protects human health according to epa's standards um, so those areas and then it shows the um this is where the storm sewer will be rerouted because the existing storm sewer has uh, goes this way and that's where they determined that the pollutants have been moving off toward Omar Circle in the, in the, uh, along the trench, thank you, where the pipe is, so they're going to cap that off to prevent pollutants from migrating that direction um, and reroute it that way and that will also have caps to prevent any additional migrations. So the gray areas are the whole plume, the plumes? Or yes, oh, part of the, yeah, so. that's part of the plume. Okay, this diagram indicates the hotspots. These images have been created by our public works team administration. So the, the square shaded areas, those are the hotspot zones. And this yellow overlay is the capture zone. And that's, um, we're trying to zoom in this part of the, the water protection plan mm -hmm. and showing that how is it overlaid over the property. Now these are estimates, projections. There's, a level of certainty there that um, that is difficult to get at. Is that Dayton Street there? Yes, this is Dayton Street. 
and Eden, that's the Vernet property, the high school will be over here, Antioch Mid Midwest is here, Omar Circle is down here. Okay, okay. Um, one of the questions that have been raised is what about our utilities, our water, our sewer, storm, and, and wastewater, and this diagram here, again, it's been created by the team, the village team, uh, this diagram indicates all of our utility infrastructure, the hot zones, and the contaminated area, and the plumes. Can you tell us what the color each of them are? Sure, yes. Um, the dark blue lines are our water mains. The light blue is the contamination area and the, the plume. The red lines are our overhead light, oh, sorry, overhead power lines. These squares with an M that are difficult to see probably from, from your distance. These right here, these are water meter pits. The red, the red circle with the, with the cross, uh, that's our water hydrants. Um, black dots are utility poles. <coughs> then there, the green lines are sanitary sewer mains. There's a few other details. Johnny, you want to cover the other details? I'd like to have someone point out the monitoring well points. Oh, I don't have no. The monitoring wells are not on this diagram. Oh, okay. But we have diagrams with the monitoring wells. So the purple up here is the the purple is the storm sewer, uh, which they are capping off. Uh, green right here represents the sewer mains that come down into the plot. Uh, blue is from a uh, main that's on uh, easting in here that runs down and actually taps off over here in Omar Circle. And the main runs from there to Dayton Street. Uh, there's also another water main down Dayton on this side. The overhead electric, there is no underground in that area, but there is poles in that area that are approximately seven feet deep. Uh, and then the associated fire hydrants with coming off of Dayton Street. This fire hydrant right here is actually capped off down here. So that's all the utilities that we have in that local area. So, so that's, we're showing that because there's some concern of, of future maintenance of these utilities, especially if they're running right through, you know, is there contamination? in that trench somewhere else that hasn't been monitored. I mean, these are things that the village is concerned about and wants to get. So that's one of the comments we we'll likely to be submitting. Um, and have, we've expressed the um, EPA already, so they're aware. Let me back up this slide here. <coughs> so if you, in, if you look right here, this is one of their hot spots that they're going to do all the excavation from. But if I go back, it's still there, and every one of our utilities are in that same area. So that's one of our biggest concerns. This is Dayton Street right here. This is the corner. This is the corner between um, Sound Space uh, and Rabbit Run Farm. This is the property line right there. Uh, which way do those uh, sanitary and storms uh, run? Do they run north or south? Uh, the sanitary goes uh, north and then cuts down and comes down towards the middle of town. The storm actually, uh, some of it drains this way, but a lot of it tries to get over to the uh, glass farm. So it goes both ways. It goes both ways. At this moment, we're into any questions that require clarification on this. Again, if the utilities are 10 feet down and the plume is 100 feet down, or if the plume is two feet down <coughs> and the utilities are not 10 feet down. I mean, you need to explain what the dimensionality is or the overlays don't make sense. I'm not sure. I, I can answer that. Okay. Um, in the wintertime, groundwater goes up and it's about four feet below ground surface. In the summertime, it goes down and it's as deep as 15 feet. And I get that from the EHS Environmental Health Service uh, report on the site. Do the contaminants stay with the groundwater or do they stay with the set 
Well, they're in the sediments, and then the groundwater leaches them from the sediments uh, slowly over time. That's one of the reasons for removing the sediments, because that's what's called the source of the contamination. All right. And that's it for the slide. So, um, there is another question. I, I want a clarification from you. Um, you were saying that these are the plan, these are proposals, um, one coming from the contractor for Vernet Lab, and EHS happens to be the consulting or contractor for the group that has filed a lawsuit, is that accurate? Yes, yes. Okay. And both of them are proposing, going back 15 years or so, um, both of them have, are proposing that pumping is, is a good idea, going back you know, many years. And that's what the plan has is sort of got implemented with the pumping up from wells. There, there were initially two wells. Uh, I um, could we go back to yes. some of the slides? I'll get the background. It's showing all four wells. Uh, yeah, there these go. are. So these are the two wells that got that were used to extract groundwater and were supposed to capture any ground or contaminated groundwater that's leaching from the source zone. The former manufacturing facility is where the sediments are very highly contaminated. So relatively speaking, plumes are not as high the contamination, and plume is being, is being derived from it. Water is coming from this direction. It is hitting that soil. And this soil is not very large. It's just largely underneath plants two and three, which probably is around here. But this is very thick, going as far deep as 70 feet. And when water comes from one side, it is dissolving some of that oily, contamination that's present in the soil. And, and just like oil and water, oil uh, will not dissolve in water. The contaminant that we have here that we use for more than 50 years will not dissolve very much, but it will still dissolve somewhat. Uh, very minute amount in parts per million. Uh, very tiny amount. And it keeps flowing. So these are the two initial wells. These two wells were added later to capture the plume. Plume will continue to progress if they are not somehow contained. Um, so um, this is a general idea. I do not subscribe, personal view. The, the plan that has been proposed by these two um, teams, Vernet contractor and the citizen group contractor, that's just my personal opinion. I have my own opinion, and I've, sh I've shared that with, with the group uh, at the last meeting, and that's what I had given in my written comment to the village administration. So, uh, we have some people here who were not there. Would you mind narrating your ideas about what you should do? Um, in, this is not a, a unique situation. As I mentioned in my last meeting, there are more than 100,000 contaminated sites in the U.S. that are, all of them are pending cleanup at various stages of cleanup. And this all started because we used the chemical 
when we did not know those chemicals are harmful. This, the awareness came around early 70s when we started noticing them and the magnitude of the problem became clear in late 70s, early 80s. When wherever we looked, we found them. So it is not a unique problem to this. this. This problem, as a result of its pervasive, you know, it occurs everywhere. Their Dayton has six locations. Every city has several. Um, and all of them are industry related. Most of them, 90 plus percent, are industry related. Former industrial activity using the chemicals. And all of them, the EPA has worked on it for the last 20 some years, more than 20 years, 30 years, let's say, almost my entire career. When I was a grad student, um, I was studying it in laboratory. And now I look, I look back 30 years and see how, how we have done. So we have understood the problem really well. And we know how to do it. There are many, many examples that EPA is aware of and have implemented. But that has not happened here. And I, I wondered why. So I have all the correspondence that have been shared with me. And going back to two, early 2000, 2002, 2005, what I found that the recommendations were made in 2005, the first one about cleanup, was at a time when we did not really know how to clean it up. And in those days, the only option was to pump the water out. And that makes sense, right? The water is contaminated, you can pump it out. And so, but we learned from many, many, many failures that pumping the water is not a solution. Imagine something that sticks to the soil. And that's what these chemicals are. They stick to the soil. Water extraction is not a solution. They, the EPA mentioned in the last meeting that they have, they have extracted, and all the water they extracted, they were cheated. Uh, by carbon, carbon absorption technique, they extracted 200 million gallons of water, approximately. And they recovered how much? 37 gallons of the chemical. Out of 200 million gallons, which shows you clearly, right in front of us, that pumping is not an option, not a solution. You can pump all you want. Their plan is to keep pumping for another 30 some years, 35 years, right? Something like that. And even then, at the, out, at the end of that story, there will be no cleanup. They think the plume will shrink, but our experience defies that. Plume, the chemical plume, it may appear to shrink, it may get diluted, Concentration may go down. Some of the other impacted areas, like over here, and some of the other areas, the concentration may drop. But you're not cleaning up anything because the chemicals are sticking to the soil. So let me let me let me finish one comment here. So clean up the way it has been done. It has been demonstrated many many times that fails. However, pump and treat is good, still considered good for containing the plume. So what people do, they do pump and treat, but they put these wells near the periphery, like one is over here, one is over here, one is over here. It will allow, the, basically, contaminant water not to go any further. But the site cleanup, this is not going to happen. Yes? I thought that there was a comment about some soil, soil removal. Yeah, 
So it's not just trumping. The proposal. Soil is they're not removing, they're limiting their soil excavation. Well, excavation, because what I'm getting me, at is Let that me finish. Um, the contamination goes as far deep as 70 feet. The bedrock is at 20 feet. They can remove the overburdened soil, which is the top 20 feet, if they really went <coughs> for it. If they went for it and really went after all high concentration and medium concentration pockets, they will remove the surface or near surface soil. Underneath, there's a bedrock. There's not, not going to be any excavation. And that was what I was raising in my last, you know, last, in the last meeting, that the bedrock contamination has not been addressed. And that was going to persist more, you know, we, there's no estimation of what that is at the moment. Okay. Thank you. That's the source area. The plume area, however, is going to persist, and this is not how we clean, treat the plume. There are well-established, proven technologies exist for plume treatment, which Abhinash, destroys the contaminant. Would you move on to explain what you think should, the optimum way you think it should be cleaned up? There are numerous techniques for cleaning up the source zone which destroys the contaminant in place, and there are well-established techniques for lower concentration plumes, again, <coughs> to destroy the contaminants. If the contamination is too high to destroy, the techniques are there to capture it and sequester it, so it doesn't spread in any further. Groundwater will not cause it to, to move. It became stationary and stabilized. So that's in short. There are many options available. I am not for any one or the other art, art, uh, technique. Thank you, Avanash. Uh, I want to point out that on that technique that we've asked the EPA to look at this technology and see how does that technology fit into the soil composition and the type of contamination that we have at this site. So that's something that at our meeting with the government and the EPA, they said, well, we'll look into that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, asking us to join you all in your, in your uh, journey. Uh, my role in this as an environmental engineer and a uh, uh, researcher at UD is to serve as a resource in any way that I can to you all. Uh, a couple of things that I'd, I'd like to highlight uh, so, uh, just to compare, uh, Avinash is looking deeply into some technology that's his interest area, and uh, just the pieces that we can carve out in relation to what our current jobs are, I feel that uh, I can best, I hope, support you in ways that are, um, for those of you that need, let's say, a, a translation from science to uh, terminology that you're familiar with. Uh, uh, how does engineering work in these areas? I would be very glad to help with. So I've not taken the time to come up with a, uh, an alternative version to what might happen at this site, uh, but I would like to speak to the resources that you have available and in line with, uh, Tom said, where do you have the opportunity to plug into this? Uh, uh, just to clarify a little bit, uh, uh, EPA and Verne, while you don't see all of the communications going on necessarily, there has been back and forth. So Verne came up with some ideas. EPA said, not good enough, try again. Uh, Verne comes back with another idea. EHS is, is not necessarily proposing overall plans for it, but commenting. They are one of your excellent resources for an independent view, particularly modeling these, this tough stuff of trying to visualize where the plume is underneath. So if we do a calculation of uh, how much sampling we pull up relative to how much, say, volume the, the plumes are or the ground that's affected underneath, recognize we have real information. You have real information on a fraction of a percent. 
But do you want to, to dig up all of that down to 70 feet to find out any more? It's just, it's a balance of feasibility. So EHS, uh, in my opinion, is an excellent resource because they're looking quite closely at what those few samples tell us. It's a rich data set because it's followed over time. And they also are looking at modernizing the techniques of how you analyze that. What's, what has 15 years of looking at this site and other sites uh, informed them in terms of the model, the prediction? Uh, I love an analogies. If you buy a new car, do you always feel as confident with the gas gauge as you did in your old car? Did you know how far you could drive in your old car before you ran out of gas? Uh, yeah. I see at least a few, right? And has anyone, besides me, gotten caught with a gas gauge that wasn't quite right in their new car? Right? Okay. So we're kind of dealing with that, except uh, with bigger consequences. And EHS has been an excellent resource in saying the gauge does not appear to be quite right. So these are the kind of uh, technical resources that while well, Avinash and I are glad to help out, EHS has been taking a very careful look over multiple periods of time. And the other resource is you. So some of the things that we've heard in, in past meetings, uh, for instance, your, your public utilities people say, this is where I have to work, or this is where my employees have to work. And I would encourage those of you around the site to think of other ways that you're interacting, that Yellow Springs is interacting around the site. So for instance, in the October meeting, uh, someone talked about what about where water runs off and children play and EPA. Did anyone else notice it caught their attention? Yeah. They did not know. They are relying on you for how you use this site. So the one recommendation that I would leave, uh, uh, strongly leave behind with you is that uh, recognize that EPA has not put out its proposed cleanup plan yet. So this period of time is an excellent time for you to think about how do you use this area? How do kids use this area? Not, not how they're supposed to, but <laughs> how they do use it. Um, how do your pets go through this? Um, um, how do people use it that aren't aware of the situation? you are the best resource in bringing that to EPA's attention or in comparing that with their, uh, when they come out saying what parts of Renee's plan they agree with and what parts they want modified, you're going to be the best evaluator of how that works uh, in, in terms of uh, surface use and access to it. Um, I think EHS is going to be your best, uh, um, best guideline in terms of whether the modelings are helping with um, plume control. And uh, so far, we haven't talked about the vapors that potentially could rise off of it. You know, so we're not talking about a lot of surface contamination concern, but uh, just like radon, if these vapors get into your house and are contained because of our good insulation, closed windows and things in the winter, uh, is that being appropriately predicted before you can measure it? in your home and take care of those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, I just have a, a process question. Through, uh, you say throughout the years, uh, there's been a back and forth between uh, Rene and EPA. Uh, there's a maybe submission or what do you think about this? Ah, it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, has the village, uh, uh, during that process, uh, has the village or has there been any chance for public uh, comment uh, uh, during that back and forth, or are we just seeing the, uh, uh, the chance for public co comment at the end uh, of this, uh, uh, these many years? Mm -hmm. I believe that the opportunity to see those things has, has been there, but, but for them to have an open calling for it, uh, I don't believe they have a public, like for the draft CMB, I don't believe they have a public comment period because the EPA was not, drawn forth the comment. They, they did not request any comments at the draft CMP before this, but the village, the Environmental Commission did review and uh, coordinate with the village, did submit along with village council, um, you know, signed off on a letter that was sent to the EPA. And it really was, yeah, so we did have some comment recently. You know, I'm new to the Environmental Commission the past, well, four or five years. 
five years, I guess. So, and it was kind of dormant back then, so I'm not sure about the whole history and what the village, uh, what other village input has been. But, um, and to jump in on that, what seemed like a dormant period. Well, in interactions aren't, they're not text. You know, it's not <laughs> an hour later, it's not a week later. It, it may be uh, years as they go back and reevaluate, come up with a new model, what's the new technology. Another key piece to my understanding is particularly around this vapor intrusion piece. Um, uh, you all, and in fact some other sites around Dayton, um, are, are bordering that transition time of learning about vapor intrusion, learning about how significant it is, uh, or in fact learning appropriate analytical ways to test for it. Uh, if it's something, uh, gaseous things are just can be difficult to test for things that are leaking in and leaking back out. Uh, just have a need more precise control mechanisms to make sure that we have uh, reliable measurements of that. And so this site is caught in that transition area. It's my understanding that when they came out with the plan, EPA EPA didn't feel they had the um, let's say the 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 strength of science behind them on the vapor intrusion pieces at one point in time to be able to, to force Brene into some better answers, but they believe they were coming down the line. And I believe, it is, again, it's my opinion that that delayed some of the exchange. Was, more to say? was that an agreement? Well, what You're, happened, they said they, they actually changed uh, their guidance documents, <laughs> and it took almost seven or more years for the EPA mm -hmm. knew that a change was coming, and they didn't want to have to go back and re-clean off sites. Yeah. There are times, you know, politics comes into it too. Sometimes that uh, um, things move forward on the maybe this will be helpful, and other times it's conservative. Like we don't, you know, don't want to put an extra burden on one party versus the other until we have more surety on it. And I won't speak to politics, sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure if I should do anything. We want to close up this session and then open up for questions. Uh, no, I would leave with you are your best resource. Thank you, thank you. Um, Excuse me a moment. I got a question about vapor intrusion. So we want to we wanna close out the session and then the next hour is all open to questions. And we have a list of questions that have been written up and collected and we want to work through those questions. So we're going to try to get through them as many as we can tonight. What we don't get through, we're, try to, we're, gonna, we're gonna compile that list and try to create a frequently asked questions so we can respond some, provide some responses and circulate that. One of the reasons we asked for your email addresses is so that we can then get back to you and, and follow up on that. Are these slides available to the public? We can make these, all of these slides available to you. Just come in and ask. Well, we can, email, right. we can meet them in lab or maybe Megan might. Uh, put some of these on, a, on, a, on an article. All right, I want to I want to highlight our position here. We've got a we've got a mandate, and, and we've got a, a responsibility to act on this remediation plan. So I want to talk about our role. The role is the village, the subcommittee, uh, the government side, and that is to facilitate a response comments to the EPA on behalf of the village uh, on the Verne final remediation plan. Part of that facilitation is having this community meeting and, and getting input from you. Also, a role to coordinate resources to determine our position on key components of the plan. Um, such as some of those resources are people, financial resources, the legal framework, what's within our legal responsibility, their legal responsibility, and connecting with experts in the field. I've been asking that Denise has been a tremendous help for us. We've also connected with the residents, um, the citizen oversight group to get feedback. And finally, we want to address. Uh, concerns that present a current challenge or risk to our residents, our environment, and our resources. Uh, an example of that would be that uh, our public works team and the EPA team, during our meeting, we talked about our utilities. And just as uh, Denise mentioned, EPA um, were su surprised to hear some of the uses of the stream. They were also surprised to see how close our water, uh, water mains are to the hotspots. And so we've asked for follow-up, and they said, we're gonna ask for follow-up related to these things. One of those follow-up is requesting additional testing near our utilities. So that's an example of how we're addressing challenges that are present now, and we don't have to wait for the statement of basis or the final report for us to provide comments on. There are things we can act on now. 
Um, so those are two closes. Take a time. Did I miss anything or team? Well, I just want to say that yeah, I, that's the village's role, but that doesn't preclude and should not preclude you from submitting your own comments. We're, we're facilitating this, get, getting input, but please don't think that that means you shouldn't still submit comments directly to EPA when, when it's posted for comment. Please go ahead and submit your comments there too. We're trying to get information to help um, you know, in, inform the, the position as a village, you know, from the village administration, but you, know, you have your own opinions and anyway, please do, don't, don't uh, disengage. Thank you. Anybody have any more cards? Okay. What will happen? There's a card in the back. There's one in the back. What will happen is that as we go through the questions, questions will arise. So please feel free to add to the cards, and uh, and we will uh, continue to go until we're at a at a right. more. Which now. probably won't happen when we're by seven. Uh, I do not. I'll be the second back here. That's a field out. All right, man. Let me put it in the stand. Okay. Okay. That works, I think. I feel like James Brown. Um, okay, so these are approximately the order in which I got them. So. See they go. Um, what is the purpose of rerouting the sanitary sewer? And f following another question that we've sort of talked about, how deep will this new line be placed? Uh, 20 feet to match the Dayton Street line? So um, it's not the sanitary sewer. There's a storm sewer that's being cut off and rerouted. And that was because there's the, the trench that the storm sewer pipe is in acted as a, as a pathway for the pollutants to migrate, especially the vapors, to migrate toward houses. Mm -hmm. So that's capped off, uh, will be, in the proposal, should not say, the proposal is to cap that off, reroute the pipe in a, in a clean area so that it prevents a future pathway. Um, was there, was the last part? Sorry, how deep would it be? The, the storm sewer, do you know how deep it is? Probably pretty shallow. Three, maybe four feet. Three or four feet. Okay. Uh, was a crack in the vat of the solvent ever investigated? Sorry to ask so late in the process. I, I think well, this has to do with the leak, I original leak. The, the, there's, I don't know the whole history, but you know, all that has been removed now. All the infrastructure, the pipes, the, you know, the buildings obviously are all gone. So, could I add something to this? Here. Industrial industrial solvents are routinely used at rubber manufacturing facilities. There is a similar situation in uh, the city of Dayton, Harshman Road and Valley Pipe intersection. The Rub Mullins Rubber is the name of the company and they have been in operation for a similar period. So you can make a comparison. The site is different, but at such facilities all over the place, people go through these solvents very frequently. They, you know, they come in 55 gallon drums and they are used in the waste. In late 1960s, early 70s, instruction was to pour the used solvents on the ground and let it evaporate. That was a level of awareness. So it's not the fault of the user or the factory or the manufacturer. That was the instruction because we did not know. So given that background, any site will use hundreds and hundreds of drums of these chemicals in a, in, a, in a similar situation. We don't have any history yet. But to assume that we only had half a drum used over a 50, 60 year period is kind of naive. So when was the last drum dumped? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't know. Doesn't matter, does it? Uh, Close for 25 years. Yeah. 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 OK. Uh, the EPA presentation says there was no evidence of vapor intrusion. When was this finding issued? Was it recent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Can you repeat the question? Okay. The EPA presentation um, says there was no evidence of vapor intrusion. When was this finding issued, and was it recently? I don't. I don't have the exact dates on that. There, this was. This has been documented in a lot of um, articles in the in the news. Um, there was testing. I think the testing was done over in ninety or sorry, two thousand seventeen and eighteen. Um, over three three seasons, I think. Um, so it was done over time. That their protocols for that testing is do it over time, and they did say at that point that they did not see the need for that it appeared to be safe and that no further testing was needed. That's what EPA um, All right, next question. Can you explain more about where the our village water comes from and how it is protected? This is the this is the the groundwater map, capture zone map, right? Correct. So I'm assuming the Please use Mike. Everything in the red is year one, one year. Where is the exact location? Here somewhere in the middle? <laughs> okay. So this is the well where the water is being pulled from. Correct. And the village is over here. All village is over here. Yeah. <coughs> this is the model. It's a numerical model, estimation, approximation, that will take five years, no, 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 ten no. years. That's the total time of total well capture. The That's five, the capture zone. That's the, the five year. Five year. What is this then? That's the, the capture overall zone. capture zone. Oh, okay. That's so it's like a watershed. If you know the water, you know runs down to a river. This is sort of the watershed, the groundwater watershed. So it'll take S ten years from water from from here anywhere here to reach the well. Take ten years. Five years. Five years. Five years. Five years. One and five. 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 Years. five. And this area is where the contamination is. So I don't know. Um, and I haven't found anything in the report. Yeah. But that's what this capture zone map can be. I think the rest of the question was, how is the water being protected? And Johnny, I think you would be yes. good to ask. Well, like you said, we do pump from here. But then I was waiting to pull that map. I did. <clears throat> Let me go back here. So once we pump from this location, uh, we send it through our plant, it actually travels and comes all the way up comes down, this is Splan Road right here, and comes over to the towers, which is in this general area, and then is dispersed through town. So we're not drilling from water directly by this site. The site water is being drawn here, it's being filtered, it's being uh, treated, and then we pump it through all of our piping system, and it goes to the towers. Can you say something and about the testing that we do for the water? Uh, that would be more of Brad, but I do know that EPA has asked us to step up on the VCOs uh, for testing, but I can't tell you. And our more recent test did not show any VOCs. Correct, it did not. VOCs. 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 Right. Correct. Good. Am I allowed to short? Oh, 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 let, let me still one second. I can tell you that just today we actually have started uh, GIS, GIS locating four different spots for the for future monitoring wells that we're installing next year. Uh, the council just approved the budget, and so these will be in place next year, and that will be will be that much further out to be able to catch anything before it actually gets into our system. So, John, how many wells we have? We have uh, monitoring wells. We have two monitoring wells right now, and we're putting in four more further out, so we can catch anything before it gets to us. Okay. I'm a hydrogeologist, and I've done some modeling, and I've also modeled this site. Um, I have some problems with the model that they did. The aquifer that we pull water from is in what's called a buried valley, and it's only within the valley. 
Uh, and that has much higher hydraulic conductivity than the surrounding stuff. And so be sure to put monitoring wells down in the valley. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I just love doing this in yellow screens because whoever comes to the, whatever be, whatever subject it is, there are at least a half dozen real experts in the room. You always get a lot of good information. Um, what are our experts saying about the proposed remediation? Is it enough? Can I take that one? Sure. So just to be clear, EPA's proposal has not come out yet. This is just for an A's. Um, and, and I would tie that into my previous recommendation that uh, time would be well spent on understanding grenades, looking for what you want protected, uh, but not necessarily spending a lot of time arguing against grenade. EPA hopefully will do part of that for you, uh, but uh, uh, be prepared for the things that you most want to protect when EPA does provide their, uh, their recommendation that is the, there was a slide earlier, um, what they're calling their uh, statement of basis, and someone had asked the question, what is that? That's their, their uh, EPA's plan that they're expecting to be in place and why. So the statement of basis gives uh, background to that too. And that's when you have the, the comment period before it's finalized. So I'll, I'll just say there are some concerns that that we've been discussing as a village, you know, from the administration, the environmental commission, and some of the experts that, that, that we are, you know, doing some additional evaluation to try to provide a more input to, um, to EPA, but really EPA, they have a staff of scientists too that they'll be, you know, like, like Jimmy said, they'll be evaluating this independently. What should we be asking the EPA for? More soil removal, more wells, more what? All of these. It's the reason we're all here, right? All of these. Okay. <laughs> that, you know, I, I would say that we're looking for the science, we're trying to evaluate the science of, of this. Like I mentioned, uh, Vernay has, has their, their consultants that have done you know, research and uh, provide, evaluate the data and provided this proposed plan. And EHS's team, has consultants from this, for the citizens, have also evaluated the data and have provided some counterpoints. And so that's led to some back and forth. And EPA said, well, they said this, and then EHS says this. And so that they're, they're looking at, you know, they're trying to weigh the, the science as well. Um, so, we're not sure exactly where the balance lies. What what is the most appropriate? You know, for example, what is the most appropriate concentration level to clean up to? Um, should there be more pump and treat wells? Should they be placed differently? I don't. Or should there be a whole different technology um, proposed for remediation, not just the? Because um, like Avinash said, the remediation proposed is really just the excavation and removal. That's the remediation part. Um, the pump and treat is to contain, uh, to allow natural attenuation, and that's the final. So, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer than that. What about the deer eating the grass? Have wildlife and plants been tested? Not, not that I know of. No, no, addition, no testing like that has been done. That I know of. Um, how many gallons are we talking about? And if somebody who, if this is someone's question, could you clarify whether it's the pumping gallons or the total gallons or the total gallons? Um, how much uh, gallon of what? So, how, how much? How much is that? Yeah. Avinash had a good, a yeah. uh, good, I guess on this. Um, we will never find out how much it is there. Because there is no, oftentimes there is no good record keeping. And even if there's a record, it doesn't become public because of the liability that it comes with now. Um, so that's a question for Vernay to answer. And they have given a very, very low number for how much an apple they have, the chemical that they have released. 
So um, that's why I say we will never know the exact number. Um, but what I wanted to go back to what Tom was answering um, regarding technology. Um, my approach will be that um, we don't wait till the EPA finally figures out the recommendation then comes with you. We need to provide them with our um, idea that management and containment is not remediation. The techniques, are there are numerous techniques for destruction of contaminants. At least the village should insist that the contaminants should be destroyed. Technique should be, modern techniques should be employed for destruction of the contaminants and not letting it persist for generations. And there are many, many te uh, techniques that are suitable. The question of what difference does it make where our utilities are on the property? What difference does it make where utilities, where the utilities are? are on the property? One of the things, um, I think John, Johnny did a good job of asking the EPA these questions. The concern for the utilities is, uh, when I was talking to the EPA, is it's not when, or it's not if we have a water main break, it's when we have a water main break. So this whole area right here, considered to be contaminated. So what do we do if we have a water main break? How, how does my staff and myself get in there, dig it up? Where do we put the soil? We gotta make sure that we don't have no backside needs going into our water pipes, because then we're con gonna contaminate the whole system. Um, so that's a big concern that we have. Right now we actually have a, a number that we call and EPA or the uh, Vernays will send out a crew to isolate this and get it repaired. We actually have a meeting set up for uh, the week of December 9th to do a site walkthrough. Um, water line is my biggest concern because it gets fed from Omar, goes over here and feeds Dayton. And right now we do have <coughs> Uh, area over here that we can backfeed some stuff, but that's a crucial water line to the village. And so the biggest concern I also have is, is when are we going to discover that water main? So it's going to sit there and pump how many hundreds or how many thousands of gallons on that site, and where's that water going to go to? So I have asked the EPA to look at uh, having them remove this water line and replace it going somewhere else away from the site. How soon? Uh, I've asked the question. So right now our, our focus will be is we're going to make sure that we got a valve on this side and a valve on this side uh, that works and we know we'll shut down that water system so that when that happens we can shut them valves off and another village water system or another villages will be uh, put at risk. Thank you, Johnny. And that's an important highlight that if we do have any, any uh, a brain, uh, main break on that line, we have identified where, where the valves are to isolate that immediately, and we'll work with uh, Brene to do the excavation and repair. So, should we learn of a break there, we'll isolate that line to prevent any of that uh, contaminants being siphoning into our system. How will you know there's a break there? How will we know there's a break there? Um, we had a break, we had a break a week ago, and we, we, we got to it real quick. Neighbors got our kitchen call when there's a water loss or they lose water in the property. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll know. We'll also have, uh, the team is well equipped to detect changes in the system and be able to identify the leaks. One of the things I can tell you with the new plant is they can see a, a high use of water over a 30 minute period of time. So then what they do is they notify the distribution side and we go out and start trying to find out where the leak is. Last time we found it on um, Wright Street because the 10 deer were drinking water out of the middle of the road. <laughs> These uh, questions are for uh, our academic consultants. Uh, is this site, uh, based on the geology, 
one that is conducive to implementing a phytoengineering technique of planting a poplar forest. Um, so, so um, parts of it would not be accessible to the roots. Uh, so we're talking about depth, the, uh, uh, the real source, the concentrated part that could, I, I think of the source of the, uh, these dense accumulations of the chemical um, being like a pot that keeps leaking, except it's kind of leaking out and up. Um, and I, at first glance, I don't see that that would be the way to get at those deep sources. So phytoremediation is using plants to draw up the chemicals and bind them, get them out of the soil. Yes, phytoremediation is a broad term, using plants for remediating the site. For such sites where the plume is deep, the roots will never get there. As uh, Denise was saying, it is for areas where there is a shallow contamination and shallow plume. Here the aquifer is very deep and very concentrated where they, in fact the, the big trees that are used for phytoremediation are poplar like plants. The roots go almost 20, 25, 30 feet. First of all it takes years for poplar to grow that big and root to grow that big and that time frame there's not a whole lot going on. So it won't even get to the plume in a short time. And even if it gets there, plant may not do well and may not grow to its full capacity if it is located in high concentration areas. But if there are shallow plumes, like in the, in the past right street, there is a shallow plume, very low level of contamination, like five parts per billion. That area, I think that is the plume is still about 20 feet deep, and the top layer is clay, where roots will not grow very well. Another question it, for uh, the academics? I'm oh, sorry, can I just one oh, So sorry. that doesn't mean that plants have no role in this. Uh, on the stormwater basis, uh, uh, if there are places where there are, say, contaminated soils closer to the surface, the fact that you don't have as much wash of water through helps to limit the the progress of contaminants. Uh, are we considering all newer remediation technologies that would be feasible to ensure the future safety of the community? We've asked about some of this new technology. The, the, uh, what Abhinash had mentioned, we brought that up to the, to the EPA team, and there are some things that they're looking into. So we've certainly asked for it. We'll see what, what decisions they make. Uh, on this. What about injecting enzymes into the plume to destroy the contaminants? We asked about the injections, and that's something that the EPA said they were going to look into. There, there's a, there's a, there are foods and substrates that could be injected, a food that could be injected for microbial stimulation, and it will work for low concentration areas where the plume is, but not for the source. In source areas, because the concentration is very high, the microbes are not able to do well because it's so toxic to them. And in those areas, you have to use a non-biological approach. So it has to be a two-prong approach, one in which we use microbes to degrade low level of contamination, and another approach we use more aggressive techniques to to capture and degrade the high concentration pockets. When the sediment is removed, are contaminants released into the immediate area? What, pro what protects the area residents? Can you repeat that question, please? When the sediment is removed, are contaminants released in the immediate area? And if so, what protects the area residents? Um, from the remediation plant and the, the excavation part of the, of the plan, they will remove the soil and spray down a carbon-based uh, liner to capture the contaminants, and that will reduce the spread of the contaminants. That's the short answer. The gases? Yeah, that's at the bottom. 
What about the gases? The gases, so that's supposed to capture any off-gassing during the excavation on that part that's being excavated. Thank you. Um, so they, they're, I think what you're saying is that once they excavate the soil, there's some contaminants in there and then you're carrying away. Is there any off-gassing and any risk of, of um, risks to human health there? Um, I'm not sure, but I know that the plan, uh, the remediation plan, they, they have to propose additional measures. Um, there's a lot of detail that's not in this proposal that um, for how they'll actually carry out the work um, when they're doing the remediation, when they're actually excavation, et cetera. So those details should be in that plan, um, in that part of the plan. They <laughs> three, uh, three chemicals are listed. Two of the chemicals are from Vernay. The third is a pesticide. <coughs> what is the source of the pesticide? You know the answer, George? You need to know some history, guys. That's Hertzler, where, where his... No, man, there was a garden center. There was a garden center on Dave Street. And as far as I'm concerned, that's where it came from. They sold a lot of goodies to the local people who wanted to put those pesticides on their yards, etc. They're downgraded from... Well... That was downgraded. I'm going to get over there on this. So, we don't know, but Verne has taken responsibility to do the cleanup. Right. Well, the, the, really, it's the old rabbit run farm, and they own that too. So. It's on the map. The up, upper blue portion is the dichlorofropane. It is, it is this area where you have the pesticide dichlorofropane, and it is this where you have the solvent that was used for rubber manufacturing. They are separate, but this happened to fall on the same boundary now. I don't know the history, but uh, the stick was over here, George, right? No, not it's, this is before that. Yeah, but doesn't, water doesn't go. Uh, I don't know. It is this it area. I don't know, sorry, it is this area that's slated for excavation is for high concentration of pesticide. I am not sure about the history of the site. That's it. Um, land was originally the village dump, and there's also a swamp. Uh, there's not a lot of soil, but there's a lot of soil. I'm sorry. I don't want you to bring that. I was in a minute. Forget that? Okay. Um, ask Denise, what is risk assessment as compared to total removal? Didn't tell me that was going to be on the test. No, just, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the risk assessment, uh, gosh, I mentioned I like analogies. Uh, there are, oh, we try to get this balance of what is the cost toward improvement versus the cost of something leaving, leaving the material there. Um, uh, so there are risks that you're familiar with, right? Uh, driving a car or walking along the street, uh, and you choose where you walk. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but you tolerate that on the sidewalk you have expectations versus walking down the middle of the street. Uh, uh, and if there were, uh, so I'm from Philadelphia, so there are streets that I would walk down the middle of the street because I, I sense danger on a sidewalk. Uh, so, so there's not always a, a one answer, but you know, how do I evaluate with respect to time, um, um, harm that I, that I can evaluate at that moment. So risk has two, uh, two pieces uh, that you're familiar with. How likely is that thing to happen, and how much harm will it cause to me beyond what I'm willing to put up with? All right. EPA has some pieces of risk that it bases on uh, human health factors that it can actually quantify uh, based on scientific, uh, uh, large bodies of scientific research that say uh, exposure of a certain amount of 
a chemical over a certain period of time causes X uh, rise in your risk of cancers. And so they will put together, so one way of assessing the risk for a particular chemical is how many children are likely to be at the site, and there's a, a factor of um, the sensitivity of children that is different than my sensitivity or, or ours. What's the likelihood that we would be uh, accessing that site if we live nearby? Differently from what's the amount of time that the public utility workers or any other workers would be on site? So these different categories are lined up, and there's this big long formula with a whole bunch of summation science in it that my students hate. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so that, it, and it's not really an absolute answer, but it's a relative answer so that we can say compared to other sites, there's more risk or there's less risk. So there are some pieces they can quantify for cancerous uh, health increases in risk and uh, non-cancerous other medical uh, pieces. There is also an environmental uh, kind of an assessment along the same lines, but it is uh, whether or not you know, I personally or you personally agree with it, the, um, the policy is set that uh, we're going to let the rabbits and deer tolerate a bigger impact than we would of humans. Uh, uh, so that goes into this risk number. Uh, and then it is evaluated against an EPA has set a standard against a certain, uh, if, it, if that difference in risk is over a certain amount, then we have to go back and do something about those chemicals, get them, either get the chemicals out or block our access to it. So sometimes it's removal and sometimes it's literally, quite literally, put a fence in the way so that we reduce the number of residents that walk across or, uh, or such. Does that get at that question? And now that's different than risk management, so that the address, like what we do about it to, to change the numbers in the equation, that's the risk management part of that. Thanks. Do you want to follow on to that? No, I was, I was going to make a comment or ask a question relating to the previous question that was raised about pesticides. Okay. The reason for raising, I raised that question, and the main reason is that many people are not aware of the fact that some of the chemicals were pesticides, which were not grenade related, and the only reason for pointing that out is that for, uh, in terms of some people still uh, are concerned about blame and, and source, et cetera, just to make it clear, public, to be clear, and it was not just Renee that was responsible for the contamination. I, would, I want to make that clear, and the question doesn't quite do that. Thanks. Um, what does the village want to do with this land? Well, it's, it's uh, Renee's property it's right now. now. <laughs> so that's all I'll say about that. Yes. Yes. But I don't know. Clearly, it's in the village interest to have this land remediated and put to use. It's 19 acres, I think. My understanding is that it would probably never be used for housing. I think there will be some kind of, uh, you call it, not easy, covenant. covenant. Um, but we're hopeful that something could happen. We don't know. We wouldn't know until this process is approved by the EPA, but I think I'm feeling positive that we will be able to utilize this property and other types of properties, examples, only examples, solar fields, prairies, things like that um, are the kind of things that it's possible would happen, but that's of course down the road after the EPA determination has been made and the cleanup is started. Okay. Do you have anything else to um, During the remediation uh, plan, there's very little that can be done on the property. Uh, I know that we've tossed some ideas internally and about making some good use of the property. One of those could be a community solar farm. 
um, in Prairie. So there are things that could happen. But again, this is for Nate property, and they can, it's their decision. Um, we're open to exploring opportunities with Renee. I think the Community Solar Farm is a good product, uh, project that can benefit the surrounding area. As you know, we've eliminated the residential solar cap um, here in the village, and we want to create opportunities for other residents to benefit from solar energy. This could be a site that could, that a project like that could go on. Now again, this is just a thought. Um, we're, we're not actively engaged in a, in a conversation with Renee about any of these activities and ultimately it's the decision for lies with Renee. And I will just add that in exchange of the property would could have risks, right, if the, about this cleanup. Um, so that needs to be evaluated and I would recommend. I know the village is, you know, aware of that. So um, that would be taken into account. Um, oh, and in the proposal there, that what um, Marianne mentioned about a covenant, that is part of the of Vernay's proposal is that um, there would be a covenant placed on the property to limit the, potent, the types of activities that could go on after um, the remediation is complete. Yes. And, and, and to that, as part of the standard to which they're remediating to, they want to remediate to a standard that would only allow industrial, commercial um, reuse of the property. And that standard allows for much higher contamination than a one of the standards that you'll see in the glossaries that is the MCLs, um, that's a much lower standard. I'm sorry, much higher standard for them to meet lower uh, concentration of contaminants. Um, so part of the remediation plan takes in consideration to what standard the EPA and Bernay would agree to remediate the site. Is that a follow-up? Yeah, I just wondered what input is required to have them do the highest possible remediation of the site for human health. Yes, there's two things going on. The, the Citizens Oversight Group has made that point clear in their documentation that they, they're requesting a higher standard uh, be met. Um, and part of that is excavating more soil to a certain point, to a certain test point. Um, so that's part of the request and also not, uh, they're requiring a higher standard to be met. And, uh, EP, the Renee Group has um, requested me CSAT standard. I don't know if Denise or Avinash should be given to the different standards, uh, but there are two standards that are being discussed, and we'll take a position on asking for one to be back to the other. And, and your input is the other way. Yes. <laughs> Everyone here can, yes. you know, make a recommendation about what the standard should be. There are two ways, there are two ways to look at it. The, the what I found in the report and the proposed, proposed plan is to remove the soil that needs a certain parameter value called CSAT. CSAT is a saturated, means saturated concentration. What it means that your chemical is right there where you have, you're removing the soil. The moment you realize that the chemical is <coughs> concentration, so this is a very low threshold, low bar for soil removal. Because the actual bar should be what kind of vapor it is going to create from the contaminated soil. So in that reference, the sixth location that they have chosen to excavate the soil is very small. They should expand that area because a large part of the soil, very close to the surface, is contaminated and they should be removed as much as possible. A point that occurs to me in all of this is I, uh, I also don't agree with the C saturation standard. Um, it's like you're going right up to the edge of the cliff. Uh, so the things that occur to me are, uh, we know that there are variations, whether it is uh, this, this kind of wash uh, um, phenomenon as groundwater uh, go, uh, moves across uh, in in the upper levels of rainwater can, uh, you know, different things are going to go on. Do you really want to be standing at the cliff when the, when the wind blows hard? 
it puts the risk on you all instead of putting the risk back on the Green A. <coughs> so there are many standards. Uh, MCLs are, uh, that's a term often applied to potable water. So it is, of the numbers that are released, it is the, the smallest number requiring the highest cleanup. And it is intended for what you physically ingest versus uh, um, contact kinds of, you know, like skin contact kinds of concentrations or this um, a concentration that is at depth in the soil that we model whether it will come to us. Verne certainly wants to work on, on that last one. What's the concentration of something far over there, recognizing that it would be decreasing as it comes toward you? So that's what Verne is trying to base on, uh, claiming that not only is, are we going at the edge of the cliff, but the edge of the cliff is over there. But again, all of this is underground. Um, there's uncertainty in some of the numbers. Uh, I believe some of that uncertainty is captured in a meaningful way in the uh, EHS uh, reports. Uh, but certainly, I don't believe that you need to be standing on the edge of the cliff. What is Verne's actual legal obligation concerning cleanup and report and or remediation versus just containment? Hmm. That's, that's, that's a hard one. Yeah. Uh, because well, the citizen group has oversight and they're pushing for things to be done. There's some obligation between Verne and the EPA, but the Verne, if there's something that they can't agree to, they can go back to the drawing board and delay the process. So EPA is not in a position to demand that something be done and be done this way and be done now. Um, so that's the, I, I don't know. Is that a question for the EPA, really? What is the legal obligation of Verne? Is that not a question for EPA? I think it, 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 it is. It's the interpretation that gets sticky. Their legal ob obligation is protection of human health. But there's, there's not a cut and dry line. Uh, and, and there certainly have been companies that say, until, until you can prove one way or the other, we're going to throw it all into the courts, which takes a long time. So from my point of view, EPA is trying to negotiate that line of keeping Verne engaged to do the work rather than just delay. So could they push Verne harder? Yes, they could, uh, with the risk of uh, Verne taking off in a different direction and not doing anything. So it's a, it's a negotiation. Well, we've had 18 years of delay, haven't we? Or 20 yeah. years more of delay. Right, right. How much delay have we already had? 30. 30. But, but do you want 50? I mean, that's, I can't answer to that, but I can say that uh, from my point of view, that's what EPA is, is trying to do. And back when some of these, uh, um, when some of the, like 70s, 80s, 90s, when some of the old abandoned sites where there weren't owners and operators in, in sight, that was the purpose of the Superfund, that the only way to get uh, protection of human health is to do something immediately. EPA stepped in, did it, and then went back for restitution of those funds to be able to go on to another site. Uh, it is, um, so this is a difficult thing. It's not quite as bad as, let's say, you know, Love Canal, where just children and children and more children literally are dying within years. Um, that doesn't mean that this is okay by any means, but it, it is a, um, it's a spectrum that EPA is negotiating. I, I always think of it like a, a health piece. It, it's the earth health instead of my health. There are some kinds of diseases you can't cure, you manage them. And, and this is the unfortunate situation of managing it. And, uh, so EPA is looking kind of like the, uh, where a doctor might look at an overall view of a set of patients. That's not what you care about. You have to worry about and stand up for yourself as the patient in this. So it, negotiation along the way. Okay, right, so just quick, quick clarification. Denise is providing uh, an analysis of, of what EPA may be doing. Certainly not our position as a village. Um, it's just what we understand their approach. So it's not what we're promoting. Three immediate follow-ups. I, I, I have to disagree with, with uh, the young lady because 
from the standpoint I live surrounding this plume. I have never been approached by the EPA, nor by the village, nor anyone else about vapor intrusion. That seems to be, if we were to collect some data from the surrounding folks that live around this plume regarding vapor intrusion, then perhaps we could provide some data to EPA that would allow, give them a little more force, I guess, toward, toward Vernet. So, you know, I've asked questions to the EP, to Vernet when they were here a month ago, and I've asked the question tonight as well. What can we, can, can the EPA, or can anyone, provide me with commercial, commercial sniffers that I can put in my basement in order to determine whether there is any vapor intrusion in my area? And I'm sure other neighbors around that plume have that same concern. So I ask that now. I hate to interrupt this, but it's important to me. That's a very good question. Question here? Um, to, to a, a side, not necessarily a side point, but a critical point to her thing is the courts have a legitimate role in this, interpreting the law. It's not that the courts are the enemy or taking things through a legal process is the problem, the, the courts establish things that are important and then have a broader application. So the courts aren't our enemy in this. They're another uh, interested party. Yeah, but they certainly had an important role early on. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, oh, and, and my apologies if I, in, uh, if I, uh, if I'm wrong, if anything that I said wrongly implied that the, the courts were not to be used, um, uh, my intent was just to identify that there have been companies that use a variety of delay tactics, and it is, um, to, to my point of view, it's kind of a chess, a, a chess game. But uh, certainly early citizen action using the courts, to my understanding, is brought um, great insight into this. Double-edged sword. Yeah. Over here and then over here. Quickly. I, I've only lived in town for two years, so I'm a little ignorant on this, but has Vernet been sued and there's a, um, a limit to their exposure in terms of paying for this? Or is that still a, an available remedy? Because if, if there's no money available, then that's got to come from somewhere else. I think that was the sword. That's this question. You know, what's for me is liability. You know, right, and, and so my, my question is, have they been sued? And if they have, presumably that would define the extent of their liability. I think the process we're in is doing that. Yes, so they have been sued. They have been sued. They have settled with a citizen group. Now, they also are responsible to remediate this property. Their current remediation plan estimates the cost a little bit over $7 million, 7.4s. Um, with the EPA. With the EPA. That's an agreement of what, this proposal that they have will cost them $7.4 million. And should the EPA agree to it, that's what they project their financial liability to be. Is there a future liability? I think that's part of why they're remediating in the way that they think that um, is best to limit their financial liability. There are things now, an example of, of some of the requests that are on the table is to excavate additional <coughs> soil to a certain point. And it estimated that that's gonna increase their cost tenfold to their, or I don't remember the exact figure, but that it would increase significant. And that's something that they didn't think that the trade-offs for the, the soil. But were and they there... just determined that it would not be 10 times, it would, yeah. it would, would double it. Okay, so double so, the excavation. Okay, so then that's the the, right. the difference that's, in number one. That's the argument. That, yeah. So you know, again, you know, who who's the who's the who's the work doing the work? Who's doing the estimating? What else? One group is saying it's ten times. The other group is saying just twice the amount. So just on that figure, you're looking at it could be fourteen million or one hundred and forty million. Right, but if there's additional um, ramification, we end up with dead children. Does the lawsuit limit? their exposure, or, or would they still be liable for that? 
there would be no limit to that. If there's an additional impact, then because usually they try and you know define the extent of the risk in these situations. It's like to define it, what we have is a citizen suit, and that is different than like a tort suit. It was a suit for a cleanup. It's under the environmental laws. So basically, they have an agreement with us to clean up, and they also have an agreement with EPA to clean up. So that's a still an available remedy. Yeah. Okay. Time check, man. We have three, 15 minutes. more minutes. Do uh, we want to keep going down this path or jump to other questions? Other questions. Other questions. Can we jump back to the vapor question for him? I don't think there was an answer to that. Was there? We don't have a direct answer right now. The yeah. EPA. Okay. There is a. All these a, questions are. There was a there. question earlier that I asked uh, Lente uh, had to me that I could follow up with the EPA and ask the, uh, the the EPA presentation says that there was uh, no evidence of vapor intrusion. Uh, one with the findings issue. How recent? So my understanding is that there is data results on that, and we can follow up on that data. Um, we can also check in about additional gas uh, intrusion tests. They, they, those they, are, they went into two or three homes, and that was it. Yeah, so that's something that we will follow up on ask right. for data, and ask if there's any, any additional tests that can be done with that. So there's no definite answer now, but we'll look into it. Thank you. I, I live on Dayton Street across from Rabbit Run Farm. I was one of the houses they tested. There was a company out of Cincinnati working for the EPA. They came by to my house. Yes. We had a talk. They put a monitor in our house. They drilled a hole next to our slab. I'm on a slab. I don't have a basement. And then they monitored that for an amount of time. And then I received a report. There was zero parts. Um, they found zero contamination. I don't know how many houses, but it sounds like only a few along Dayton Street. Obviously, I don't know if they any on Omar Circle were tested. I can bring in the report if you want to see it, the name of the company and such. Mm -hmm. TRC is the company. Yeah. So we'll follow up. Mark, do you just know the number of homes? Um, I, I understood there were five homes in none towards Wright Street, and also there was vapor detected in one of the gas wells. It was on, they did a perimeter uh, gas wells to measure vapor and uh, approximately three years ago, there was um, a dangerous level of vapor detected on their property, not in a house, but on their property. So there is off gas. On Vernon. Yes. On Vernon, but we'll follow up. Okay. Um, any question back here? Is that germane to this discussion right now or? We move on. Move on. Um, have funds been reserved to cover the estimated cost of remediation? That, that was mine. We kind of answered. Yeah, we answered that. Seven point four million is what they estimate this will cost them. What did the EPA and the village talk about in their October meeting? How confident is EPA in Vernay's latest plan? Mm -hmm. What did we talk about? Yeah. We went through the just about the entire plan. And we raised concerns. This is when our utility uh, uh, concerns around our utilities and infrastructure came about, and we spent time talking about that. We also spoke about the legal framework. We talked about some of the liability on the property, uh, traditional things come up. Um, what could the property be reused or redeveloped for? Um, so, that in a nutshell is what we discussed. It was a two hour meeting. It's on tape. Is it on tape? No. no you're talking okay. about two meetings. Oh, two meetings. Oh, yeah. The private meeting and the public meeting. Oh, so what's the question? <coughs> what's the meeting? Both meetings? Private meetings. This is what did the uh, EPA and the village talk about in the October meeting? I guess that means the private meeting. The private meeting. Yeah, that's what, what I just covered is what we discussed in the private meeting. And she's saying there's a video of the public, of public meeting. There's a video of the public meeting, correct. Um, will the village pass the well capping ordinance for is asking for? We have not had a discussion around that. We are for, we are familiar with the request, but we have not um, discussed that in depth and and have any uh, related uh, to that. that. Could you briefly explain the question? Yes, the request is that the village pass an ordinance to cap off all wells on private property. What kind of wells are drinking water? wells? Drinking wells on the property. Could you please follow up with me about that since I regulate the private water system walls? Okay. Because 
it's not a village ordinance. Again, we haven't had a yeah. discussion on that. We haven't entertained a discussion, so we don't have a position on that. Yeah, but I can provide additional yes. pathways yeah, or framework. We'll connect. Let's connect. We have 10 minutes. We're through a third of the questions. Um, we will turn all the questions over to Josue. He will look for answers and get back to you with them. But if you have something really germane to this particular question that we have just been talking about, uh, we'll entertain it now, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just delay moving we'll on a little bit. Uh, you. Okay, very quickly, uh, there's a lot of interest in geothermal heating systems for homes to save energy. And I'm hoping whatever well ordinances are passed will still respect that need in the village. Uh, is the person who was responsible for generating this graphic here in the room? No, but the administration is, and we can tell you what went in it. Okay, so uh, it, it doesn't sound, I, I'm just curious how many data points uh, were, went into the generating that sort of ISO line of concentration, I assume. It looks like, it sounds like a whole lot more data points were collected in order to generate that degree of refinement. Okay, I'll be brief. This chart right here, we took the, the graphs from the TRC models and graphs and we wanted to overlay it with our utilities because one of the concerns um, was uh, how close are utilities to contaminated land. So this blue shaded area, that's our team replicating the TRC graphs. So this is not ours. Okay. Do you know how many data points they used to generate that contour? I don't, but I can... It's 45 monitoring models. 45 monitoring models. And a model. And, and there's a very different graphic that the NHS has produced. Okay, Maybe. we'll talk later. Thank you. Okay. There were a lot of other wells made that were uh, probe wells that were one day in uh, vibratory wells pushed down about 15 or 20 feet. Uh, those don't appear to be on any of these maps, but there were many of those done throughout the village. Okay. Those were for vapor testing. That's what they were for. Next. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Uh, what is a plume? Is it contaminated groundwater, uh, contaminated soil, vapor contamination, or all three? Comment that. um, commonly, that's used uh, to refer to the water that is of a substantial uh, um, variance in the uh, concentration of a particular chemical. And substantial would be somebody's standard of it's over a certain amount uh, beyond what we would expect as a background. So in short, it usually refers to water carrying some dissolved chemical. It can be applied to gaseous, but in underground situations more commonly water. Can you say where the ground water is? I mean is it on the surface, five feet, ten feet? Oh oh groundwater. So this would be uh, well um, I'm sorry, relative to the question of plume? Yeah, I think that. So be under, this would be water uh, underground. Um, to go very simplistically, on the ground, the soil maybe have lots of moisture in it, but still lots of uh, gas pockets. As you go deeper, uh, you get to some point where um, all of those spaces between the soil particles are filled with water. Uh, um, we did, actually, I should turn this over. <laughs> I'm sitting here. Yeah, the answer the is, experts. in the wintertime, it's about four feet deep to the water. In the summertime, by the end of summer, it's 15 feet or so. And the bottom of the plume that they've identified is down at 70 feet. And they've never drilled a single well into the primary aquifer. Which is what we sure needed. Shouldn't they have one? And, and I'd like to have a, a minute before we close to talk about that wellhead protection plan or source water protection plan and the fact that they haven't drilled a well. That's a whole other subject, but okay. <laughs> I can do it fast. Um, so there's a question here about groundwater versus stormwater. Um, Bright Street floods often, basements flood versus uh, contaminated groundwater entering the basements during flood events. Does groundwater to stormwater mix? Should the village residents be concerned? 
Can you repeat the question? Uh, I'm not sure. Groundwater versus stormwater. Right Street floods often. Basements flood. Uh, is contaminated groundwater entering basements during flood events? Does groundwater to stormwater mix? Should the village residents be concerned about this? If the basement is flooded, it means, like he mentioned, I forget your name. Peter. Peter saying the water, the water that below which all the poor spaces are filled with water, and you know, if it is flooding, mean that is risen and risen to the level of the basement, wherever it is, and as some of the water is entering, if the surrounding area of where the home is located is contaminated, where the plume is, the contaminant will be in the basement. It's very simple. But it depends on the location of the house and location and the position of the plume. If it is situated right on top of the plume, contaminated water will enter if the basement floods. So like those places on Wright Street over there that right. cross? Yes, yeah. that area. But that level of contamination is low. It's about 5 ppb. Okay. The contamination is really high in this area um, where the factory was. So even though there is contamination, the potential for vapor is we have to measure it. You, there's no way you can predict. There's there's one other there's one other data point that we have, which is, um, you know, the plume is moving this way, and there's a storm sewer here, and then that goes out um, to the stream uh, at, at the glass farm. So um, there is they do sample there twice a year too, and they sample when Brene samples all the wells. They also sample at that outfall where the pipe. Um, discharges stormwater into the stream. So it is showing some low levels, um, and it varies, but it's been very low um, compared to the surface water standard. Um, it's sometimes very, very low. So anyway, there are samples that show that there is some chemicals getting into the stormwater that way. Um, um, but the stormwater level is much higher than the plume. Plume is yeah. Much lower yeah. than Stradley. So the, it's from the, the groundwater, water that's in the ground is getting into the pipe and then going out. Probably. We, we have a couple of minutes left. Marianne wants to do a uh, kind of a roundup. Peter, one minute. One minute. Okay, you're on. Okay. So. <clears throat> This is particularly important. Um, there's very few data points to draw these lines from, so they're really quite approximate. However, we do know that the recharge area for the primary aquifer is in this area. And can we get the thing that shows the orange? Uh, there we go. Okay, so this means the groundwater is going that way. We know from all the test wells that the shallow groundwater is going this way. This, the data that draws this, is from a deeper aquifer, which is called the Brassfield Sugar Rock. It's a very prolific aquifer, and it's never been tested, not once. There need to be some wells drilled into that aquifer and tested, and what happens is Vernet doesn't want to do it because they're worried if there's contamination there, it's going to be terribly serious for them economically. Um, so their consultants haven't done it. They've known about it. They knew the aquifer was there. They just haven't tested it. Um, the Ohio EPA just was simply letting them do whatever they wanted. I was unaware that the US EPA was involved. Uh, but now that the US EPA is involved, maybe they can force some wells because this water is eventually going to end up in the well field. Yeah. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add something to what Peter said. Whatever the cleanup is going on is happening near the surface, top 20, 20 feet or so. 
contamination that will be left behind after this is much deeper. And we're not addressing that in this plan. And I'm raising this concern. This is my second time. I just want to make you aware that this is a not a good plan in that regard. We should address it. And the potential risk that I just heard from it, that it will end up in the deeper aquifer, which is very common. For fractured bedrock, the upper aquifer connected with the lower aquifer is common. So thank you for coming. Uh, this meeting clearly didn't wrap up things on something that's not only very complicated, but pretty emotional from wherever you stand. So I'm going to ask Josue to let you know what the next steps the village is going to do. But as long as if you have signed on to that sheet, then we will be updating you through that, through an email, uh, group email, as to whatever questions that haven't been answered and next steps. So. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, from your questions, we have a long to-do list, and we're going to reach out to the EPA and follow up on some of these things. Uh, so just want to refer back to this timeline that we are between these phases. So we have an opportunity before the statement of basis is completed for us to ask the EPA to follow up on certain things. The water well um, source is one of those things, the utilities and a few others. I want to re reiterate our role, that our role is to facilitate this response comments to the EPA on behalf of the village, residents, businesses, the environment, uh, on this remediation plan. To coordinate our resources to determine our position on a lot of these concerns that have been raised, and those resources are you know, our people, our financial, legal, uh, and our expertise, so we're, we're coordinating that. And that's Part of this coordination is your feedback, and that's important. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't go on your own and make these comments and requests from things. Um, and finally, we're addressing some of these key items that are urgent now, such as the water utilities. Um, we, we're not going to wait for the statement basis to be completed to ask that these concerns be addressed. So. Well, I, I wanted to thank the, all of the Environmental Commission, but two other people Mark Ewald, who's sitting there, and Nadia Malarkey, who had to leave, were both part of this team. I'd like to also thank Abinash and Denise for coming, Johnny, yeah. Josue, Tom. Um, they put in lots of hours and will continue to be putting in hours. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will stay in touch. And um, yeah. And also, I think it would be good for us to let people know how they can make comments to the EPA. And we'll do that. Oh, you can say that to the board. I got a question for you. So good. <laughs>